right, let me, uh, let me go through a case and, uh, and see how, uh, just, just putting it, you know, this, top, this, this discussion into, into uh, uh, practice, and just get your opinion how, how you would manage this uh, a patient. So let's say we have a 52-year-old uh, gentleman as, you know, just a little fatigue, a little weight loss, no night sweats, uh, and, uh, and uh, is, is checked by his primary care physician, and is found to have a high white cell count, let's say uh, around 200,000. Uh, we have a, his, the, the patient's anemic, may have a hemoglobin uh, around uh, seven, seven and a half, platelets elevated, 720. Um, the differential has 14 basophils, 9% blast. You examine the patient, has splenomegaly. Um, you do the bone marrow, you confirm that the patient has the Philadelphia chromosome, no other chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, let me uh, uh, propose that the patient has some comorbidities, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, history of uh, coronary artery disease. Um, so, you know, a patient like this, I, I, I'm sure you've made the, the math very quickly in your mind, but if not, uh, the patient has a high risk so called score of 2.82. And, um, and no other abnormalities in the liver or kidney or anything, anything else. Uh, uh, AKG shows nothing special. QTC is uh, no, uh, 4, 420, let's say. Um, so Kevin, how, how would you approach this, uh, this, uh, this gentleman with newly diagnosed CML, chronic phase, high risk so-called, some comorbidities? Uh, what would you do? Well, I mean, there's a few thoughts going through my head. Uh, this is definitely a patient with a high risk disease and we would like to give him the best outcome to prevent the progression to accelerator blast phase disease. So in that sense, we would like to consider a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, I am a little bit concerned about the coronary artery disease and the risk of uh, cardiovascular events uh, in this patient. So I would want to make sure that all those cardiovascular risk factors were optimized before starting the patient on a second generation TKI, which have slightly more cardiovascular risk than uh, imatinib. So if we could feel comfortable that those risk factors were optimized, then we could consider a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor for this patient. But certainly it will be a, a sit down with the patient and their family and discussing the pros and cons of different approaches. Um, I think from the QTC point of view and electrolytes, we're good there. So we, we're, that's important to make sure that they are optimized before starting the patient on a second generation TKI in particular. So let me, let me put you on the spotlight. Um, yeah. What prescription are you going to write? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I would be between uh, nilotinib and disatinib. Well, he's putting in the spot. Yeah. <laughs> put, put in one or the other. <laughs> Which one? Uh, oof. Oof. Um, I think, you know, the data for second generation, for the ENEST and D study, is very convincing in terms of uh, prevention of progression to accelerated blast phase disease. So I would go with uh, nilotinib. Can we go with nilotinib. Um, Javier, what do you do? I will um, go with the satin. But the only reason I will go in this case is because a 52-year-old maybe have like a more an active life, maybe be working. And in this point of view, well, I mean, I definitely consider and I do exactly the same thing that Kevin do, right? I really go through back and forth all the side effects. But, but in people of this age, I find like, a, well, they, they may have a, a better if not better adherence, the more convenient way to, to do that. I fully agree that we're really concerned about the cardiovascular events. And in this case, was not a reason why you didn't go to nilotinib, which I think is fine. I think yeah. I don't really scare away of, of cardiovascular events. But in this kind of patient, in the younger age, I may really, you know, try to, to be in an approach where they really feel once a day. So considering the high, the, the, the risk features for arterial thrombotic events, um, Anybody, David, uh, Harry, would go with imatinib? Um, I'm not saying that anybody, whether anybody thinks that imatinib is inappropriate, but just anybody would say that that's my first choice? I, I would not, be based on the, on the SOCOL uh, high risk. I would go through this uh, difficult uh, uh, risk-benefit ratio of, of the various second-generation options. I, I tend to lean towards nilotinib. Um, but I would want to be sure that, that the cardiovascular yeah. risks are, are well controlled, but I would not use imatinib. Right. Okay, so I completely agree with um, what people have said about the cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease. In the decision trial and the NSTND trial, 
they excluded patients with um, some cardiac comorbidities, but these were very well defined, unstable angina, uh, a recent myocardial infarction, uh, QT prolongation, bundle branch blocks where you can't measure the QT, very specific. They didn't exclude patients who had these risk factors. Now it's true that in both of those studies, it, it was amazing to me how similar they were. The risk of cardiovascular events, uh, ar arterial occlusive events was about 2% with imatinib, and it was about 5% at five years with both nilotinib and tisatinib in two separate well-done studies. It wasn't zero with any of the drugs, including imatinib. And so I always think of it about like the patient in front of me. Yes, I might have a slightly higher risk of cardiovascular events, but when you look at those patients in both studies, they had very poorly controlled cardiovascular risk factors. So one thing we've said today is very important to, to partner with a good internist to manage those things. I often check these things, uh, hemoglobin A1C and lipid profiles once a year, not because I know what to do with these things anymore, <laughs> but I know how to find a good internist <laughs> to, to do so. Have you seen all the drugs for diabetes? It is incredible. Yeah, amazing. I mean, amazing. you know, actually, that's another topic. Right. So, so that would not, you know, shy me away from using a second generation drug. The goal here is prevention of uh, progression in, in, in a high risk patient. Um, and I'm going to now be a little controversial. I would pick nilotinib, and I would pick nilotinib. You're not controversial. Um, You're really agreeing with. Me. Well, wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> come on, come okay. on. Give me that. Okay, so so on the on-label dose would be nilotinib, okay. 300 milligrams twice daily, right? But if you look closely at the NSDND trial, okay, they had a 400 milligram twice sure, daily sure. arm. And if you look and in an intent to treat way, in other words, patients who started nilotinib 400 twice daily versus imatinib, actually at five years, there were f statistically fewer progressions with that dose of nilotinib that you start with. So fewer progressions and actually progression-free survival and overall survival were statistically significant as published. So. It was, about, it was 96% with nilotinib at 400 twice daily versus 92% with imatinib once daily. Okay, very, very close, very close numbers. People would say, well, that's just the statistical uh, gods playing, playing with us, but it I is what so. it is. So I'll just finish by saying, could I get away with using 400 milligrams twice so let me, daily? Let me, let me cut you there and then tell me what is the incidence of cardiovascular events in the in the 400 compared with 300. It, it was a little bit higher. A little bit higher? Yeah, uh, just a little bit <laughs> higher. <laughs> so, how much higher? How much higher? Okay. No, no, but no, okay. My, my point is like we were talking about cardiovascular events and we were talking about that. So I agree that, that there is this difference, but I will be, I mean, no, we can even go. No, but you didn't hear the important point. Remember okay. what I said? The survival. <laughs> Overall survival, okay. isn't that what we said we cared about? Okay. It was 96% no, versus 92 progression. You say right. progression. Now, but let me, I'll just finish by <laughs> saying okay. the patient has 9% blasts, 14% basophils. This is a person that we're saying has high risk CML and chronic phase. It is smelling a little bit like accelerated phase two. Sure, you know? absolutely. And so you could make the argument to use a higher dose of your first line TKI in a patient who's coming close to accelerate phase. Because we don't know how, you know, these, these criteria well, we use are quite point. arbitrary, and we don't know how biologically yet to, to define what accelerated phase is by some gene expression profile. We don't have it commercially right, available. Right. So you could consider it. So I told you I'd be controversial, and, uh, but, you were. But, but my choice would be nilotinib 300 milligrams twice daily, because that's what insurance would pay for.